And so this then separates two major viewpoints. One that makes the event of the Exodus very close to Egypt, mm -hmm. and the other one much further away, in a sense. One's a, a marshy lake, right, and the other one's a mighty sea. Yeah. And that's the conflict in this investigation with the Red Sea Miracle. Welcome to Along the Way. I'm John Matarazzo, your host and fellow traveler. Thank you for joining me along my way as I try to become more like Jesus every day. On this episode of Along the Way, I'm joined by my friend and filmmaker, Tim Mahoney. His journey to find patterns of evidence that happened in the Bible has led him on an incredible journey, and I'm glad to be able to sit with him and talk about his next film, The Red Sea Miracle Part 1. I'll get to our conversation in just a moment, but I want to thank you for listening and subscribing to Along the Way. And those of you that have rated and reviewed Along the Way, an extra thank you. Making this show has been an incredible journey for me, and I really appreciate all the feedback that I've received. Through Along the Way, my voice has been able to reach people in 42 different countries and so, so many different cities. I want to give a big shout out to Jill Mahoney, Tim's wife, for listening and being a fellow traveler with me. She let me know that she's been listening to Along the Way ever since I first interviewed Tim back in episode four. She's listened to most, if not all, of my episodes. When she let me know that, that really brightened my day. Jill, thank you so much for joining me along the way. If you want to listen to my first conversation with Tim Mahoney, you can go back to episode four. I'll be providing a link for that in the show notes as well. I'm so excited whenever I find out that new people are listening to this show. I would love to hear from you. Please email me at johnalongtheway at gmail.com and let me know where you're listening from. All of my socials and contact links are in the show notes. I look forward to hearing from you. And now, here is my Along the Way conversation with Tim Mahoney. Tim Mahoney, it's great to have you back on Along the Way. You were just on the Real Life program a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful to have you back in the Pittsburgh area and to, to talk with you in the flesh. Mm -hmm. We've stayed in contact since the last time you were with us and uh, actually got to do a FaceTime with, as I was showing patterns of evidence to a group of friends. Oh, yeah. You and I were texting. I remember that. Secretly. Uh, and uh, so I said to, the, I said to my, my friends, hey, do you want to talk to the filmmaker? And they're like, wait, what? This, yeah. is, this is crazy. And uh, so I said, yeah, I've been texting with him, and he's, he's willing to do a FaceTime. And so we probably talked for about 15, 20 minutes mm -hmm. or so with them, and yeah. they had some fun questions, and they still talk about that to oh, this day. Oh, do they? Oh, yeah. Well, that's great. They're excited about the next film. One of the things that you're here today with me to talk about is the Red Sea crossing, the yeah. Red Sea miracle, really. Right. And uh, there's, we know that that happened, but there's some debate about where... And that is the next part of your journey. Mm -hmm. And so let's uh, let's just talk a little bit about what God has done from the Moses controversy up until up until now. Right. Well, the first film that I actually was planning on making was the one that we're making right now. And uh, you know, it took an 18-year uh, detour, mm -hmm. <laughs> as it were, because uh, there were questions that needed to be answered. Uh, when you're making an investigative documentary, you're not plan. You don't know what you're going to get into. Right. And what I got into in the very beginning was the fact that people said, "What's the point in searching for the rod of the Exodus? Don't you realize, Tim, that there's no evidence for the Israelites in Egypt?" Mm. And I was like, "No, I didn't know that. In fact, that in the film, the patterns of evidence, the, the Exodus, you know, you'll see. I come home and have a crisis of faith, right, right, you know. And uh, so the last that was, and, and and by way, you know, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, but you know." When they talk about medicine, they say he's a practicing medicine. Uh -huh. Well, I feel like the same thing. <laughs> You're a practicing filmmaker. A practicing filmmaker. Yeah. I, I mean, practicing and practicing and practicing. And, you know, the um, uh, the Karate Kid line, mm -hmm. which is fantastic, which is wax on, wax off. Right. Wax on, wax off. Filmmaking for me has been a long wax on, wax off process. I made other variations that I was trying to understand. Mm -hmm. How do I communicate you know, complex information and make it entertaining and what kind of points of view. And finally, the patterns of evidence approach became sort of the formula that after a lot of waxing on and waxing off, <laughs> yeah, really, you know, came to organically figure it out because there are threads within these films. Mm -hmm. The one thread that I didn't realize was maybe, and that's why it's taken so long, is my own personal life, my mm -hmm. own personal journey going into this investigation was one thread. 
the primary thread, though, was the Bible. Hmm. Was what does the Bible telling us happen? So it's foundational. We start with the Bible and its narrative. Mm -hmm. What does the account saying happen? Then there's what have people found in the past? Right. Or what evidence is there for that? And what are the different interpretations of that evidence? Mm -hmm. You know, how are people interpreting the evidence? Oh, yeah. I mean, you look at the world today and we can show somebody that this thing, this event happened and people will... I mean, there's, there's still people out there that say that the Earth is flat. There's evidence that proves that the Earth is a sphere, but there's people that still say that evidence doesn't prove that, that it's, it's flat. So if people were debating about that, where it's really not that important in the grand scheme of things, something about the, the truth of the, of the gospel, the truth of the word of God, there's going to be a big attack about that because we know that the devil doesn't want people to believe in Jesus, ultimately. So... You're doing a great job of shining light on those things that need to be exposed. You know, when we start out in life, we don't really know which direction we're going. I mean, I remember growing up, coming to the age of, of going to college, and mm-hmm. you're trying to figure out, well, what are you going to do with your life? There was an earlier part where I thought I was going to be involved with music. We talked a little right, bit about right. that, uh, and I played music uh, in I played uh, in a family in, band that wasn't your family, yeah. right? I, yeah, I was a, a, I was outside the family. Yeah, and I played in other groups, and uh, but I always was interested in the arts mm-hmm. and music. And eventually, when the thought came about possibly being involved with filmmaking, that began a whole other interest of the drama of storytelling. But I also like nonfiction mm-hmm. uh, in the sense that. Uh, I mean, I, there's nothing wrong with fiction. I think it's it's interesting. But I've often found, in, in even more so lately, nonfiction documentaries, and mm-hmm. some documentaries are fictional, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a gender. They're actually not documentaries. They're more propaganda. Right. Films right. that are made to look like they're truthful. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's even been a lot of discussion about that lately, that there are a number of documentaries that are not really truly documentary. Mm-hmm. They're propagandistic. And, sure. Uh, but the point being, there's a power to an investigative documentary where you're uncovering information Mm -hmm. or you're basically examining someone's life and you're going back and looking at all that because it resonates that it's real and there's so much today that's artificial that I think that that's why a documentary approach maybe impacts a person more because there's so much that you know that's not really real. Yeah. And when you actually, when I go to a superhero movie, mm-hmm. you know, like my kids want me to go see something, and yeah. I'm kind of exhausted at the end of it because <laughs> I don't really, it's not as if I believe that it, any of it was real. They're, they're right. not like the emotional stakes that I used to feel in mm-hmm. certain movies. But I do think in a documentary, there is more emotional connections because you're starting to see that this is real or this is happening that was an area that i didn't know that i'd be caught up in Mm -hmm. when i started this because i always wanted to make feature films right right and so what's happened is is that i've been able to actually blend the two disciplines of a feature film into an emotionally appealing historical documentary style and right. patterns of evidence. You do a great job blending those together with all the films that I've seen so far. The Moses controversy, mm-hmm. um, you know, over lunch we were just starting to talk about that. And one of the things that I took away from that film was that from the very beginning, God really cares about communicating with us. And God doesn't want to just speak to the elites people that are well-educated. He wants to speak to every single person, no matter what stage of life we might be in. God has a desire to speak to us, and that's why he created the alphabet and gave that to Moses. And that's one of the things that the Israelites were different about because everybody else in the ancient world, only the elites were able to read. But right. God designed that so that we could be in communication in a really re- uh, in a relationship with him. Right. That's one of the things that I took away from, from that film, for sure. Yeah, and I'm glad that it became clear because when I work on a documentary, there's a sense of direction, mm-hmm. but I don't know exactly what we're going to uncover. Right. And I feel as if I have a providence working in my life to show me certain things. I have a sense that oh, I need to take a closer look at this. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's very, very clear. I could be sitting in a in our offices or whatever, and I just feel like I should go look at that book over there on you know. Yeah. And, and I'll go. I wouldn't. It's like. Pay attention to that, you know, like over there. And it's maybe we've had it sitting there for a couple of years. I'll pull it off and I start looking at it and then I'll I'll look, wait a minute. 
Here's some really important answers. And that's what happened, by the way, when we were investigating the Moses controversy. And the premise of that film is that people are critical of mm-hmm. the authorship of the, of the first five books of the Bible. And I took a completely different direction on that in that I felt that, well, let's just hold that thought for a moment and let's just ask the question, did Moses have the ability to write? Right. What would he have used? Because the first first five books, it's actually one book, the Torah, mm-hmm. which has been divided into five books, was was written in Hebrew. That's what we're told. So the question then would be is, well, where did this Hebrew come from? Right. And was it available to people? So I asked the question, what was the writing system that he would have used? Yeah. Uh, was there a writing system that wasn't, let's say, Egyptian? Mm-hmm. I think I just asked the question, what is the writing system? Is it in the right time right. of history? Is it in the right place in the world? And is it a form of Semitic writing, mm-hmm. not, let's say, hieroglyphic? And then the fourth one was going to be, it actually pops up, is, is it alphabetic? Yeah. Because the Hebrew is an alphabetic script. And then the fifth one that comes on top of it, could it be Hebrew? Mm-hmm. And so and that film basically looks at all that and starts to then un, you know, uncover right. this connection. And then what we talked about was that, go ahead and say what, what you, what it really, how it impacted you, what you realized. Just that, that God always wants to communicate with us because of his relationship. And so if God wants to communicate, then he provided a way for us to yeah. do that, to understand him, not just... He removed the barrier from God speaking to us so the common man could understand by reading the Word of God. Yeah. And, you know, the Scripture says that I think it's the very heavens declare the glory Mm -hmm. of God. And I've never been great at memorizing verses. I struggle to memorize things. There's certain things that I can remember, but there are other things that are harder for me to remember. Mm -hmm. But if it's in a, let's say it's in a story form or a narrative, I seem like I can remember all that. But names of people and and, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and certain things, it's like that recall is a little bit harder. But then if you look at that is why is it important that things are written down? Because you could forget. And Moses is told by God, he tells the Israelites to write these commands on their doorposts. Right. Teach them to your children so you won't forget them. But he says, write them down. And the question then is, is that, well, if the Hebrews are, let's say, illiterate people yeah. and they're slaves, how in the world are they going to write it down and what are they going to write it down with? And what you're going to see is, is in the Moses controversy is that the uncovering of the, it's called proto mm-hmm. you know, that's the earliest form of this alphabetic writing, that common people, not the elite, were the ones who were using this. Mm. And they were writing and scratching it in places where slaves would have been. Right. And guess what? That's exactly what the Bible says the Israelites were. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It sets up the Red Sea miracle. That film was saying there was a writing system. And I then say, well, if we know that Moses had the ability to write, Mm -hmm. then what he wrote was an eyewitness account of a journey. Right. An amazing journey out of Egypt to the mountain of God. Mm-hmm. And that's what this next film, The Red Sea Miracle, yeah. is going to be uncovering and exploring. And a lot of what people understand or picture about the Red Sea Miracle comes from the movies like The Ten Commandments. And I'm trying to, The Prince of Egypt is the other one yep. that I'm trying mm-hmm. to think of. These giant walls of water on either side as they're crossing the sea. But you've come up to this fact that there's different arguments about where that could have actually happened. Right. And so tell me a little bit about what you've uncovered with that. You know, context is part of my sort of my nature. In order for me to understand, it's like uh, drawing out a map of an idea. Mm-hmm. And so because I'm a visual person, I like to draw things out. And so I have to kind of know, how do I organize? Because it's such a bunch of information. <laughs> it's right. like, it's intimidating. You don't know, get your head around it. So what I like to do is to basically, once I've listened to all these different viewpoints, I try to figure out how do I categorize? Mm-hmm. How do I categorize all these ideas? And we found out that they're basically, when it comes to the route of the Exodus, there are two different camps, and there sometimes can be a little overlapping with what pe- people's views, but for the most part. One of the camps I call Egyptian, mm-hmm. and that viewpoint has come to the conclusion, and it's the most popular viewpoint today, mm-hmm. that the early books of the, the, that the early books of the Bible, that Moses borrowed words from Egyptian, and they're very similar. Mm-hmm. So the sea that was crossed in the narrative of the Exodus, 
is called Yam Suf in Hebrew. Later on, it becomes Red Sea, mm -hmm. and eventually it becomes the Sea of Reeds. And so what they're saying is the reason why it becomes the Sea of Reeds is because they think there's a connection between this Patufi, which is an Egyptian, Patufi means place of reeds, and Suf. So Yam Suf, it means Sea of Suf, they think it is connected to Patufi, okay. which is reeds. That's what their connection is. And they're saying, seeing some of these words, and they're saying, we believe the words around the crossing site, Migdal, well, what does that mean? Because it says mm -hmm. that the Israelites were at a camp between Pihahiroth, Migdal, and the sea. So they're going, well, Pihahiroth, we think that might be mouth of the canal. And Migdal is a name for an Egyptian fort. And the Yam Suf is possibly a sea of reeds. So they place this crossing by lakes mm -hmm. in Egypt. The other group is we call the Hebrew, gotcha. the Hebrew approach. They're saying Moses was writing in Hebrew. He was not borrowing words from Egyptian. They're saying that the sea that was crossed has geographical indicators in other parts of Scripture, as well as when Moses talked about the boundary of Israel. And he uses the term Yam Suf as the southern border of Israel. Mm. And so they're saying... It's not a lake next to Egypt. They're saying it's the boundary. The name of this sea also is the boundary of the promised land. And it's over by the Gulf of Aqaba. Yeah. And so this then separates two major viewpoints. One that makes the event of the Exodus very close to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the other one much further away, in, in a sense. One's a, a marshy lake. Right. And the other one's a mighty sea. Yeah. And that's the conflict in this investigation with the Red Sea miracle. This is only part one. That's right. Well, it was such a big investigation. Honestly, you know, when you film for years and years and years, and you know how this goes, yeah. you have a lot of data, a lot of content. And one of the things that you're trying to sort out is, how do I organize it all? I mean, there's a lot behind this story. But yet you still know that the average person isn't interested in all of it. Right. And some of it's not pertinent. But in this case... Our films have multiple viewpoints. So what ends up happening is that when you're building that multi-viewpoint fortress, mm -hmm. you know, themed film, you have to give more screen time to everybody. Yeah. And so if I'm going to give screen time to the different viewpoints, that eats up other, you know, you're sure. dividing it out. In this particular case, there's only so many minutes in an hour. <laughs> there's 60 last time I checked, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Well, if you give, let's say... Let's say you have four viewpoints, then each gets 15 minutes, but then you realize, well, I also have to tell about what happened mm -hmm. earlier so people understand context. Right. And so you... Because context is very, very important. That's right. And, and because of the discipline that we've used to help people understand context, they come out of these films going, wow, I really understood this. Mm -hmm. And what I saw before with working with scholars, they didn't give me any context, and they were talking to another scholar. Mm. And over time, I'd have to say, I'm not really sure if I understand exactly what they're saying, but I'm trying to interpret clearly. Right. And so that's why in a Patterns of Evidence of film, we give the definitions of certain words. Yeah. Don't yeah. assume that you know what that word means, you mm -hmm. know, like wadi, yeah. like well, W-A-D-I. Well, what's a wadi? Because people talk about it. Well, they went down this wadi. Well, wadi is a dry riverbed valley. Yeah. And if, if it's raining, look out. Get out of that wadi because in rain in the desert, you'll get swept away in a flash flood. Mm -hmm. That's an example. You know, and the word elef is used in this. Elef is actually a Hebrew word for thousand. Mm -hmm. And another big question on these two different viewpoints, an Egyptian viewpoint versus a Hebrew viewpoint, is the question of, in Hebrew, does Aleph mean thousand or does it mean clan? Yeah. Because there's supposed to be 603,000 men. That's what the census was saying. Mm -hmm. And so, well, if that's the case, if you had women and children, it could be two to three million people right. in the Exodus. And people in the modern mindset can't get their head around that that many people could have existed yeah. in the wilderness. Let it's, alone travel that many miles yeah. in the desert. Right. But, with water. But we don't know exactly what the desert looked like back then either. Well, 3,500 years ago, uh, look at how much the, just in, let's just say the Dust Bowl that happened during the time of the Depression. Right, right. You know, if they're talking about global warming. Well, we're talking about something that might have been, you know, 3,500 years ago. It might have been a desert, meaning a wilderness, but it, we don't know how much water. And there are lakes that disappear, lakes mm -hmm. that reappear. Um, 
actually in the Death Valley, I think it was, there was a rain that came, and the entire place looked like a beautiful, long, uh, you know, it had water, it had flowers, yeah. it had grass, it was but it was the Death Valley. Right. And that's in one of our thinker updates that we had in the past. And so what you're going to see is that you're absolutely right. We don't know what it looked like. Mm-hmm. And But the Bible says that it rained abundantly, mm. that God provided for these people. Yeah. And another question is, is, is if you look at the number of people, when the Israelites came into Egypt, it only addresses the men. It said there were 70, but they was really talking about the men. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you know this, but when Abraham earlier talked about when he went out and tried to rescue, I think it was Lot, Lot. Yeah. Uh, he mustered about 300 men of his you know, servants. Oh, yeah. That, they, they kicked some serious butt in that yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. But there was just Abraham and Isaac. I mean, the, you know, in other words, the two principles of that family were right. Abraham and Isaac. But he had like 300 men you know shepherds mm-hmm. or and they were you know they were something to be dealt with they could right. go after and chase down a king well guess what happens if you end up with Jacob and his 12 you know when they're all there right. and they're multiplying over a period of time if you just take that number and do the math and have multiple generations you're going to end up with more than 5000 or 10000 or 20000 oh, yeah. people and that's what some people are saying is they're saying well it was much smaller numbers mm-hmm. so but there is a problem with that in the biblical narrative, because the narrative is telling us they grew into a mighty host so much that right. the Egyptians were fearful of them. Exactly, yeah. And the Egyptians wouldn't be afraid of just a couple thousand people. Yeah, if it was maybe five, fifteen, you know, ten, fifteen thousand, it, it doesn't make sense why they would have put them in slavery in the first place for right. four hundred years, or for you know, they're saying two hundred <laughs> years. I think the time of well, that's a different topic. We yeah. won't get into. But how long were they slaves? You know, yeah. uh, the promise from Abraham actually begins, I think, at like four hundred and thirty years, and then later on in Abraham's life, it goes to four hundred. The time period was the time the promise was given. Mm-hmm. I know if your audience is understanding this, but when people think, well, how long were the Israelites in, enslaved? There's a little bit of jump there in the sense that. What I'm saying a jump is that they weren't slaves, I don't believe, for 400 years. No. The promise came, uh, and it would be, for, you know, in 400 years or 430 years. It starts with 430, then sure. later on to Abraham it's given it's 400 years. What it's saying is that it was the also included in that from that promise was the life of Isaac, the life of Jacob, the mm-hmm. life of Joseph. So some people think that that enslavement time was more like 215 years. But the point being is that over that period of time, they would have multiplied. Oh, yeah. And sure. so that is a tension within this film is asking a question, well, if these people multiplied, how many people were there and how did God sustain them in the wilderness? Oh, yeah. Which is, I mean, the book of Exodus is and Deuteronomy numbers. They're just filled with miracles that sometimes we just kind of forget about because we think they crossed the Red Sea and they yeah. were right into the promised land. Well, we forget yeah. sometimes that there was 40 years of going through the wilderness that's right. And uh, sometimes in life, it feels like we're going through a wilderness at times as well. But God works on miracles and uh, can sustain us. You've got a second part of this coming out. Right. And you're busy working on gathering information about that still, which is really cool because it seems like God's bringing a lot of things to you that is new information. Is there anything that you can tease us with? Well, the question of chariot wheels yeah. is going to be the big 800-pound gorilla in the room for the part two of the Red Sea Miracle. And the film is really about miracles. So on one side, it's not as if there's a silver bullet if you found one piece of evidence, does it you know, mean that all this, all, you know, the Bible's true or whatever? The narrative goes like this. The biblical account says that the Israelites went to the sea. They were trapped. God miraculously parts the water. The Israelites you know, go through it, mm-hmm. and then the Egyptians follow them. They have a problem, and their wheels get stuck, and they end up being destroyed. So that is the question of of then people said, well, if they got destroyed, could there be any remains of the chariots on the seafloor? And that's the part of the investigation that drew me in 20 mm-hmm. years ago. I thought, well, that's fascinating if right, there right. could be something there. So I'm trying to close the loop on that because we have interviewed people mm-hmm. who have said that they found something. And in this particular case, I even had one fellow take a lie detector test because they didn't bring anything up. They're not supposed to touch coral right they're not supposed to be it's against the law to do anything but you can photograph it some people say well why is it then that people don't get any good photography of this stuff if they say they see it and that is frustrating 
but we're going to have eyewitness account mm-hmm. uh, of that, and we're going to explore from marine biologists with the photography that's already been given mm-hmm. that we have that we can show, and we're just going to we're going to dialogue about this, as well as even a bigger question. We're going to show how water would part in a shallow body of water, which is a scientific Mm -hmm. method. We actually have a model that was created, and we're going to show what's called a wind set down model of that. And we're going to show, you know, other crossing locations. So there's, I think we've got, as far as examples goes, you know, we're going to show the lake theories, and we're going to show other theories Mm -hmm. for on the Gulf of Aqaba. In some in the places you wouldn't expect. Oh, wow. So that's what the next film we'll be doing on May 5th. And from there, we're going to then unpack much further with the help of C.S. Lewis and Hume, okay. <laughs> you know, the philosopher, the question of miracles. And then do miracles happen and can they still happen? And so that's what we're exploring in the next film. And we're going to actually... I, I, I asked someone, I said, well, do miracles, is there any really document, you know, academic proof? Because I was expecting a no. Mm-hmm. And then he said, yes, there is. And I said, really? He said, yes. Dr. Craig Keener has a two-volume set that he has documented miracles. So we said, well, let's go talk to him. So yeah. Jill and I packed up and we went and filmed him. And more information started coming out. And... And so we're going to actually discuss the fact that miracles, uh, could they have happened in the past? He says, well, they're happening, yes, so they're even happening today. And that goes back then to eyewitness account. Right. And the authenticity of the person who's writing, you know, what is it that you need to verify that something is a miracle? You need an eyewitness account. You need to have a trustworthy source. That's why the writing system was important. Mm-hmm. Moses, was he trustworthy? Did he write an eyewitness accord? Did he write it soon after things happened? All those things that are are necessary to document information about miracles were present when Moses was writing the Torah, according to what we know. And not only that, but we started by saying, and he had a writing system. Mm -hmm. And not only that, this writing system has historically been shown that it came at the time and place in history where the events happened. And that writing system became the foundation of all alphabetic I'm saying a writing system, meaning an alphabetic writing system. Right, right. And then I think it's pretty clear that there's a connection to it being Hebrew. Yeah. Which boils down to why is it that God wants us to know about these events? How significant was it that a writing system appears that's alphabetic, that common people can learn? It's simple enough that it only uses 22, 24, 25, 26, you know, depending on which system you have. That writing system becomes the basis for how the Torah, the first books of the Bible, were assembled. Mm-hmm. And then you think about it, that the book that utilizes the alphabet more than any other book in the world is the Bible. Yeah. Now, is that a coincidence? Now, if you're a believer, you'd say, no, it's not a coincidence. Other people would say, well, it's just the way it is. But I'm saying, well, what if the fact that we have an alphabet is not just a coincidence? but that it was meant to retain the knowledge of God. Yeah, because God wants us to know him. Yeah. And that's his whole plan of redemption for us. One of the things that I've appreciated, now I've seen three of your films now, David Roll has played a big part in the first Patterns of Evidence. And the book that he wrote really helped you kind of understand how the Exodus, the way that it was, the way that we've understood it is more is plausible. In the Moses Controversy, he uh, explains a lot about the alphabet, the yeah. uh, proto uh, alphabet. But in this film, there's some difference of opinion right. with that, and so I appreciate that you're not just in you're not just in his camp, or you know anybody, any of these experts that you're talking to. You are following the evidence and presenting that to people. So, um, and, and what David yeah. Roll would say, "I've just been misled." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, because he says, "Oh, well, basically, I'm giving the different viewpoints." Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and we discuss this. Am I completely neutral? People want to know. Well, what do you think, Tim? Right. You know, you're on this journey, and what I do know is that I do have a point of view, and in this particular case, I favor 
the miraculous Red Sea mm-hmm. parting, but I want to understand why other people have come to the conclusion where they are. Right. And so I'm going to give them their fair chance. I want to know also, for example, why an, an agnostic or someone who doesn't believe or has different viewpoints, can you explain to me how you got here? Mm-hmm. Because I'm trying to understand it, because I'm not there. But And I think that people really appreciate that because they feel like they're more free to make a, a decision about this. And that's why I like the name we used for our company called Thinking Man Films. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm the thinking man of the Thinking Man Films. And I'm just saying, okay, uh, the films are based around questions. And so the question is, is did this event happen? And and if they say it did or it didn't, I say, why? and Or where did it happen? Uh, and did we find anything? Mm-hmm. And it's such a foundational event in the biblical narrative that it's something that I think we need to know whether or not it happened. Right. Absolutely. And, and, and then the, the hard part is, can you find any evidence of that? So yeah. I think I think the answer has been, well, yes. I think we've found something to, to look at, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. Th- which is going to be fairly intriguing for people. Well, Tim, I know you're, you're busy and you've got another interview scheduled right after this one. And so I appreciate our friendship. I appreciate what you're doing to explaining the patterns of evidence that God is showing you and you're presenting it in a way that the common man, just like me, yep. can understand really how great our God is. Well, if people are interested in these films that are coming up, uh, PatternsofEvidence.com. PatternsofEvidence.com. Now, obviously, uh, your podcasts you know, have different times when they're right, airing, yeah. but for those who are, can see it, uh, February 18th, it's going to be in over 800 theaters, February 18th, 2020, and over 800 theaters for the first episode. It's a fathom event, so if you go to PatternsOfEvidence.com, you can see the trailer, you can learn about it, you can read about the cast. Mm-hmm. And then May 5th is part two. May 5th, 2020 is part two in another 800 plus theaters, and people are very excited about this movie. Oh my gosh, yeah. And we got a panel discussion at the end of it. And those Again, are so much fun, Yeah, really hearing all that stuff. And our films are so big, they get an intermission. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's an event. It uh, is. It really is an experience, so. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it on the big screen, myself and uh, I know my family they're excited about seeing it as well and uh, you sent me a screener because you were on the real life program so I got to see it ahead of time on my small laptop screen and I texted you right away and I said this is so good you leave me wanting more and I know that everybody that goes and sees this you're gonna want to know more of what Tim has found and about the patterns that God has shown him yeah so Tim, thank you for allowing me to join you along your way again on this journey. Well, thank you very much for having me, John. It was great to be able to spend time with Tim again. His passion for finding patterns of evidence is very inspiring. I hope that you get the opportunity to see his films, especially The Red Sea Miracle Part 1 and 2 coming out in May. For that information, go to PatternsOfEvidence.com. I'll be providing links in the show notes. Thank you for listening to Along the Way. If you've enjoyed joining me along my way, please share this episode with a friend who you think will be encouraged by this podcast. Also, please rate and review Along the Way in iTunes. That helps more people discover this podcast. And subscribe to Along the Way on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and at my website, alongtheway.media. I hope you've enjoyed this part of my journey, and may you realize when Jesus is walking with you along your way.